All right, so you remember a few episodes ago we had this uh, discussion about photography and how it preserves things? Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Um, so the camera I've been using is an SLR, not a DSLR, but an SLR. But I just bought something I want to show you here on the Zoom call. Uh, uh, it looks like a little black leather pouch. Yeah, opening the pouch. Look at this. What does it look? What does it look like? A, a gray brick that I assume is some sort of camera. Yeah, li listen to this. Isn't that cool? Is that the lens? So this is a film How camera. How old is that camera? I don't know. It's called a Nikon 35 Ti. It is like, it's a coveted point and shoot camera. Like it is a camera that photographers have claimed is one of the best point and shoot film cameras that was ever made. That's up for debate. I don't really know if that's a thing or not, but check this out. On the top, it's got this little needle and like if I want to shoot in aperture mode, I can do that and then I can just roll a little wheel. What? And it will change the aperture and you you read it on these needles. It looks like a gas no gauge. Way. Doesn't that look cool? I'm shooting on an SLR as well, courtesy of you. Thank you for that once again. Yeah, you're welcome. I use uh Speed booster? No, I don't have to have a speed booster with it. I go straight to a Sigma lens that I, I really like, one that I use with my digital photography. I'm going to take a picture of you while we're doing this. Thank you. I'd like that. In just a second, let me move this microphone. It took a flash. I don't know if that's going to look good. I saw the flash. Uh, it's just going to look better. It's just going to flash in the screen. That I just failed. I wasted a, an image. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's like a buck. Yeah. I owe you a buck. <laughs> I should have warned you. I should have thought of it. But one of the tricks with that is that I have a really tough time having my hands off the wheel, so to speak, on all the little fine tuning stuff that I'm used to doing with my digital cameras. So when I'm taking those pictures, I'm like, I, I, is this aperture correct? I don't know. What am I even allowed to adjust? How does it work? It's very, very confusing. And this thing, it looks like 1930s or 1940s little dials and needles there on the top. It looks like instrumentation from an old plane or something from the era of the Rocketeer. Yeah, it looks like and a gal it's called a galvanometer is is what it was in physics class. It's like the little needle and there's a magnetic field that moves the needle. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, it is beautiful. So what I've been learning is how film works. And what I've learned is it's literally silver crystals. There are little bit, little bitty silver halide crystals inside. Sounds super new age. I know it's pretty crazy. And so, you like wear them near your heart, and it reveals things. No, to you? not like that. No, it's just like little bitty ground up pieces of silver halide, which is like silver and like some I don't know, I don't know what it is, chlorine, fluorine, bromine. I don't know. I don't know chemistry very okay. well. But as the light hits it, it changes the 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 crystal to turn it into a latent image. And then the developing process actually amplifies it. So when you look at an image on film, you're looking at literally silver metal. It's really cool. So anyway, that's that's what I've been researching, how film works. And uh, I'm working on a video about that. But I, I thought the, the idea of capturing something in a physical form so that you can have it indefinitely, even though it was just a, a little moment, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, likewise. And I've been puzzling over something similar, and I appreciate you being willing to come into this conversation effectively, blindly. I wanted to talk with you about a similar process of grabbing a snapshot of something. So part of the beauty of taking a picture like you and I take when we hang out with our families is that even though it's only been six weeks or eight weeks since you were up in my neck of the woods hanging out, already you all have changed, we've changed and that picture, that moment of us in the Black Hills, that moment at Mount Rushmore, that moment in my backyard, those can never really truly be repeated. And we have this little flat, two-dimensional, paper-thin memory, physical expression of memory that we can put hands on and we can put eyes on. And it will always be a little bit of a physical connection to that irreplaceable, unrepeatable moment that happened right there. It's almost like an apparition. It's like a 
a sample Ooh. that represents the whole, or but it, but it's an ephemeral kind of feel to it. Like the moment came and went, but we have this little reach back moment of it that we're able to, in I don't know, extrapolate the entire experience from. Is that does that make I don't know? It's almost like you have to yes. interpolate everything. Yes. Lately, I don't know if it's the algorithms that I've created all working against me at once, but I keep getting served stuff about another kind of hypothetical snapshot, and that being a snapshot of somebody's brain at death. And I don't mean like a death mask. Have you ever seen one of those? Um, I saw Brady did a video about Isaac Newton's death mask. So when, yeah. when he died, they put plaster of Paris over his face, and that's a that's a death mask, I assume? It's a snapshot, right? It's the same concept, right? It's one last remembrance of what that person was while fluids had still been recently pumping and before the decay of death starts to set in and disfigure and change. It's one last shot at recollection. So death masks were something you could make. I mean, uh, you see some living masks as well where people put straws in the nose so you can breathe when you make that plaster mask like they do when they put an elaborate the rubber masks on actors and things like that for special effects. But for the most part, the idea there is this is a final memory of this person as close to their last breath as you can get. But in that same spirit, as technology advances from plaster of Paris to the digital world, no doubt somebody at some point was going to have it occur to them. Well, if we can save memories, what if we can find a way to save brain memories? So I'm thinking about the death mask. So you moved from a camera snapshot to the death mask, yep. which save thing, saves things in three dimensions. Yes. So it's a three-dimensional representation. You know they have methods nowadays, uh, it's like 3D laser scanners. There's a guy here locally, a friend of mine. It, they, have a, they have a whole company called LiDAR USA, and they create LiDAR. Uh, it's, it's basically radar but with lasers. They use yeah. light to bounce it off of objects and they scan a three-dimensional area and they can reproduce everything in 3D. And they'll mount these on drones and they can fly them over anything. They can fly them over crops and approximate the yield of oranges in a in an orange grove or, or they can fly them you know over a field and count the number of sheep. You know, they can do all these different things using these, but you can also take a snapshot of a three-dimensional time it's called TISP, time space position information. And so you can go to a place and it's almost imagine pulling the pin on a grenade and you throw the grenade and it shoots light out in all directions and then it captures the light and then you can reproduce the three dimensional world. Is that where you're going with this? Yes, except for the brain. What do you mean? We as people believe things are transcendent. Doesn't matter if somebody thinks there's a God, not a God, whatever. Only the most devoted nihilist or naturalist would say there's no pattern and no meaning to anything. Humans assign meaning to stuff. If if there isn't meaning, we'll find it. We're wired for it or evolved that way, depending on how you see the equation. And so we like these snapshots. They matter to us. They preserve something. In 1999, when I saw The Matrix and I saw them jabbing sticks into the back of the characters' brains and somehow they could upload Kung Fu and memories and entire environments for a disembodied version of themselves to go and run around in, I thought what I would think about that now is absurd. It's fascinating. It raises a lot of moral questions. Wasn't there a a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie as well? Some Unreal Soldier or something where they would also upload things to their brain stems with a big needle? (sighs) Yeah, that kind of sounds right. All of those Van Damme movies from that era, (laughs) including the one where he does the splits in the commercial, they all run together for me. Remember the splits on the Anya yep. song? Oh, my goodness. So, so downloading brain stuff. I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. So it's become very trendy in the last two or three years of entertainment to explore this idea of what it would look like to create a digital afterlife, to find a way to map memories and consciousness, to digitize that, to then create an environment for that version of the self to go and live in into perpetuity and presumably somehow to monetize all of this. Again, maybe it's just a fluke of the algorithm, but I keep getting this stuff served to me more and more. And 
I'm starting to see people who are trying to make the case that this is not an entirely unrealistic idea. Hold on, wait. Now, stop, 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 stop. You said the phrase digital afterlife. Yeah. Like, what does that even mean? So, if well, it's, what does that even mean? So, life, life implies that you're alive. Yes. So, afterlife to me implies life after death. Yes. So, digital afterlife implies something digital that happens after the moment when I die or my physical body is deceased. Yeah. But the fact that you put the word life in there implies that it's digital life. So it's almost like artificial life that happens after you die. Am I tracking? Everybody wants to live longer. People do crazy things to avoid death. The human buffer bar of mortality is an intimidating thing. And yes, what you just described back is it's what I think people are pursuing. Some sort of solution by which your mind, your consciousness, your memories, whatever makes you you in the invisible sense can be mapped. Like what you described with the, the LIDAR. You put a flash grenade in a room that sends out lasers in all directions capturing a digital print of that moment except with your mind. And then I think the idea is... That that we're engaged right now, or a few people on the fringes of science are engaged right now in the pursuit of an entirely technological afterlife. So initial question that I would have for you that I would like to workshop is based on where we are at right this minute, what are the hurdles to make something like that happen? Okay. So there's, there's a lot here. <laughs> there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot here. So first of all, I, I've thought about these things, but not in the way that you're talking about it. So for example, I have an unlisted YouTube channel that I film a lot of stuff around the house with the kids and the fam. Like the other day, I sat down with the kids and actually this was last year. I just found the file. I negotiated to buy their teeth. I know this sounds so stupid, but we, we don't... Um, the tooth, I, I know you pretty well. It, yeah. It, the tooth no, fairy, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not stunned. The Tooth Fairy doesn't visit our house for many, many reasons. Um, but uh, as a result of the Tooth Fairy not visiting our house, I negotiate with my children for their teeth. I use it as an opportunity to teach them how to negotiate. Okay. And turns out, I, I had forgotten this happened. I start the camera facing my face and I say, all right, all right, kids, you wonder why we've uh, brought you here today. It's to buy your teeth. Daddy's going to buy your teeth. And I turn the camera around and all the children are there. And I go in one by one negotiating with them to buy a tooth off of them. And if it's got a cavity, it's not worth as much, all these things. Long story short, this is a really precious moment in a, in a young family. And you want to keep that. And you want to know what that was like. So I have uploaded that to email addresses that I've assigned to each of my children. And when they become a certain age, they'll be given the password to this email address. And they'll go in there and they'll see when they started riding a bike. They'll see when their brother was playing baseball that time. They'll, they'll see when they sold daddy a tooth for him uh, to who, I don't know. It's funny. Like my youngest daughter, she says, Hey, you can have this one and I'll give you $5. And I was like, okay, you can pay me $5 to take this. It is so cute. <laughs> it's a disposal fee. Yeah. Like a is. battery or oil. It's so cute. So in this way, my goal is for daddy to be alive in the minds of my children long after I'm gone. So I've done that. I've also got a fail safe where I have recorded a video directed to my family and it's in the safe. Have I told you about this? It's in the safety deposit box. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing. So these are the mm -hmm. ways that I hope to, you know, in effect, speak to my family after I'm dead. Do you screw around in that video or are you all serious? Like if you're watching this, uh, something terrible has happened. Yeah, I say, so I, you know what? It's long before YouTube. So I don't actually remember what's on the video. I should probably go. I mean, it was filmed in like, 2011. I was going to Africa. Okay, so you screwed around at least a little bit. A little bit. I think. I think I say something like, "Oh my goodness, I'm dead," you know, or so, whoa, you know, <laughs> yeah, something like that. But I really need to go watch it. You know, we've had additional children since then, <laughs> so I need hmm. to make sure everything's relevant. Yeah. But um, 
yeah, that, that's a way to speak beyond the grave. But that's not what you're talking about. You're, you're talking about a way to interact with the world, if I understand correctly. Like, if you could capture an algorithm, it's almost like a simulation of the person at a certain moment. Like, if I were to say this, how would Matt Whitman respond? And then, I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot. Is this, is no, this... it's why it's such a ludicrously difficult proposition. You you took us right there. I mean, the two sides of the coin are the existential, which you intuitively brought up, talking about the video you made for your family in case of your, in the event, not in case, we're all going to die, in the event of your passing when that happens. You went to the existential, the shared moments, the beauty that is memory. We haven't talked about the curse that is memory as well. And then you started to shift gears into the technological hurdles. It was one of the first questions that you had to wrestle with. I mean, for the theist who believes from whatever their religious tradition is, that there's some sort of afterlife, that there's some sort of notion of heaven, you don't have to worry about the environment. The deity character handles the environment where the deceased go in this afterlife in every different religion. The deity makes it. And so it's great. Streets paved with gold, whatever the conception is, it's just there. In this conception, one of the technological hurdles is you have to figure out where this consciousness, if it were to be harvestable or duplicatable, where does it even go? Do you slap that thing on a robot and just have these things gradually pop up? And maybe a hundred years from now, you got people wandering around the streets in their physical avatars. That sounds really unappealing to me where I sit right now. Or do you create some Skyrim type environment where everybody goes and effectively plays a video game, except that it's their entire existence in Oasis kind of situation? The technical hurdles are really fascinating to me before I even get into the existential hurdles, because how would you even begin to map the amount of data? I mean, a mind is a world unto itself. I'm too simple a man to understand how you could one and zero the human mind. You understand this world better than I do. Can you even fathom a method to take that complexity and boil it down to a program or memory? No, but but one thing that I think it would have to be able to do is grow. Like, let, let's just say for a second that hmm. you are able to map the human mind in, in some type of program, and not just the human mind, but a specific human mind. I think an important attribute you would want this program to have, or this, I don't, it's not an algorithm, it's like this entity to have, mm. is you would want it to be able to develop, and as it interacts with the world around it, it would learn from that. I don't know. I mean, I, I think about the afterlife a bit. <laughs> and Me too. I think the ability to grow and learn and, and advance and better yourself I don't think it's going to end at the grave. I think it's an interesting thing. Like, if you were to freeze, I don't know, there's a running joke about Walt Disney freezing his body cryogenically or something like that. Sure, and, uh, Ted Williams. <laughs> right. And so I wonder if if you could freeze yourself and then reanimate yourself at some point in the future, what's the intent? Uh, is it because, I don't know, there's, there's so much here. This is interesting. This is an interesting topic. Well, first of all, what's your take on the afterlife? Well, I think there is one. I understand that that's going to come off as insane to the purely naturalist thinker, but the purely naturalist thinker and I, and I am an unapologetic theist, we have a lot more in common than you might figure. If we're both operating in logical structures, we have a different take on how things happened in the first place. For me, I don't think existence and matter are eternal. I don't think time is eternal. I think non-existence is more likely and makes more sense than existence, and yet there is existence. That's crazy to me. That's kind of like the cosmological argument, right? Kind of. Yeah, a little bit of a twist on that. Since you and I can agree that existence exists, I'm 100% sure I exist. I am almost as sure that you exist. I guess you could be an elaborate program, and so is everyone else, and I'm the point of everything. But my experience doesn't reinforce that. It says I'm some guy and everybody else is also some person. And we're not fake programs that, you know, serve the NPC role to spice up Destin's world. Like I'm an actual person, you're an actual person, and our Venn diagrams overlap occasionally, and that's where the fun happens. 
and that so well, that's Descartes that said that, right? I, the, uh, I I think, therefore I am. Yeah, very good. And so yeah, yeah. I I think that <laughs> not to get too weird, not going to go down this rabbit trail very far, but that that has a lot to do with how I built up my belief system as well. It's like I know that I exist, and I know that there's some kind of moral law, and I know that I don't. I don't do things that I feel like I should for some reason. And I also feel like I do things I feel like I shouldn't for some reason. And so that feels like something above me. And so moral law feels, you know, self-evident to me and then extrapolate and, you know, keep on going down that road far enough. And pretty soon you're, you know, you're, you're at a church. <laughs> so I don't it, know. It, well, it's hard to draw all those parallels, but, that sure. has a lot to do with how I ended up where I did as well. That has a ton to do with why I was back in after I was out on the whole faith thing. I simply could not find a satisfactory explanation for why there are things instead of not things. That's not the whole or some of my faith, but it's a big deal. But that that cogito ergo sum, I think that I don't know what that means. Oh, that... it's it's just that's the name of the the argument. Okay. It's it has a ton of far-reaching implications. It has far-reaching implications for the individual because we do have a sense of self. We can think of things and if I ever want to prove to myself that I'm actually here, all I have to do is try to think of something that I wasn't going to think of. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's even like thinking about fate in general. So we got this version of the world that is unfolding before your eyes and my eyes right now. And all I have to do to change it from one version of the world that was going to play all the way out to maybe a different one is drop this little remote in front of me like I just did. If I didn't, that's an entirely different version of reality. Well, who decided to drop that remote? Me, because I thought of it. And so I think, therefore I am, and I participate in this larger world, this larger unfolding of reality. It's just existence is something that gets cheapened with the word existential because we we take that and we think of just like, oh, I'm angsty and I feel things inside. But existence in and of itself is such a fascinating line of thought to deeply explore both for our notion of self and for how our notion or awareness of self affects our ability to understand what this whole proposition might be, that proposition being existing. <music> Hey, this episode of No Dumb Questions is brought to you by HelloFresh. It's America's number one meal kit delivery service. You get fresh pre-measured ingredients, and, and yes, I'm reading this because they say it better than I do, and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door so you can skip the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. They have that really dialed. That actually is a wonderful summary of the whole thing. That's pretty much what they do. The deal with HelloFresh is you get to learn how to cook. It sounds like a little thing, but it's not a little thing. Like the sauces are amazing. The fact that you can take normal ingredients that you would see like sesame oil or garlic or whatever, and then you can do a little choppity chop chop and then a little sizzle sizzle and all of a sudden, boom, crazy sauce. Like it's amazing. So I, I highly recommend it just for that reason alone. You get to learn how to make cool things and it's made the not HelloFresh food that we eat at our house that much better because we know how to like do things in the kitchen now. Well, when you say crazy sauce, that sounds like just an expression, but I think you actually mean it. Like it's crazy how good it is. And as a not stylish grill guy, I mean, I, I make stuff on the grill and it tastes fine. I can handle my own business well enough to not starve to death if I'm home alone. But prior to HelloFresh, I really had no sense of what it would look like to make food taste better to do weird creative things that dry out all kinds of flavor explosions and make it awesome. It's just, that wasn't in my realm of thought at all. And now what I'm finding is that pretty much every meal I'm getting with HelloFresh, I and mean, these are the kinds that I really seek out anyway, they all have some kind of super unique creative sauce with ingredients and elements I never would have thought of. And it's like I'm rediscovering food. Yeah. It's crazy. So the way it works is you can, well, here, let me just do the promo code thing for you. So if you go to HelloFresh.com slash NDQ12, that's for no dumb questions, NDQ12, and use the code NDQ12, you get 12 free meals, including free shipping. Yeah, they send you 12 food meal things to your house for free. It's pretty impressive. 
So you do that. But the cool part is you get to pick what you get. They have over 27 meals that you get to choose from. You can do the veggie option. You can do the classic stuff. All these different low-calorie meals, if you're interested in that, craft burgers, whatever, you get to choose the meals. So you get to say, you know, I've never made like an Asian dish. I'm going to try that. Or I've never made whatever this is. You know, I, I don't even know how to say that, but I'm going to try it. They send it to your house, and you actually learn how to cook it. So you become intimately familiar with like how the flavor comes to be. It's amazing. So anyway, HelloFresh.com slash NDQ12. Use the code NDQ12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. Yeah, I want to double down on that, too. If you haven't gone and looked at these recipes for a while and then you go back now, the last time I looked, which was only a couple of weeks ago, I was blown away by how comprehensive the coverage is. Everything that I could think of or that I've ever heard of that is what people eat in terms of a, a palate or a food style or dietary style, they were all on there. They have thought of everything and accommodated everything deliciously that anybody I've ever heard of is doing in terms of diet or menus. It's very, very comprehensive and seems to be continually expanding. And you do the math on it, and it's cheaper than shopping at your local grocery store. Some smart company called Zagat. Do you say Zagat or Zagat? How do you say that? I don't know. Why did you put me on the spot? I don't know these things. I'm super sorry to embarrass you. It's spelled Z-A-G-A-T, and it's one of those words that I see everywhere. And I was afraid that one day I'd have to say out loud, and now I have, and I feel nothing but humiliation. But what I know is that they did the math on it, and they found HelloFresh to be 28% cheaper than just running to the local grocery store. 72% cheaper than going to a restaurant, and the food is, as we've talked about, spectacular. So it's an awesome deal. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and the cool thing is they send you the right amount of each ingredient, so you're not feeling like you're wasting stuff. It's a good deal. Totally recommend it. HelloFresh.com slash NDQ12. Use the code NDQ12 at checkout. 12 free meals, including free shipping. I just thought of why that Zagat word throws me off so much. Because if I say the Z like an S, it sounds like I'm talking about Bob, Bob Saget. Saget. <laughs> <laughs> or the big Thai guy that you fight right before M. Bison in Street Fighter. Yep. Sagat. I know got, the one. I don't know. So the take home here is twofold. One, I don't know how to say that. And two, HelloFresh is really good and you get 12 free meals, including free shipping, which is incredible. You can get that by going to HelloFresh.com slash NDQ12 and then you use the code NDQ12. So thanks, HelloFresh. And thank you, you, for liking HelloFresh. And there's this big circle of symmetry and synergy that happens when you order this using that promo code. Absolutely. Thank you very much. But you're you're quickly running up into the whole free will thing and the, you know, <laughs> everything is determined for you already. You're quickly running there. And, and you could say on the other side of that argument, you could say, yeah, but the chemicals aligned in your brain to you would have always dropped that remote in front of you yeah, because of the way yeah. the chemicals. I mean, that's the obvious. But I don't know. I feel like I have free will. That's all I can say. You know, hmm. th there's this discussion that goes on about free will or unconditional election in the faith circles. And you can oh, as it pertains to Christian notions of salvation, you mean? Yeah. And you can spend a lot of time there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's this one verse in there somewhere that says, make your calling an election sure, which seems to include both free will and election in the yeah. same verse. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'm out on this discussion. This is above me. I don't know anymore. <laughs> so, you know. Well, it, I will say this. If Christianity didn't have that tension, I would immediately dismiss it as a fraud. How can you have, like, even if the whole thing is a fraud, still, how can you have a system of beliefs where you have a supposedly completely unlimited divine character. There's nothing you know that that character doesn't know. There's nothing you can think of that that character can't, hasn't already thought of. Every possible outcome, every possible past, every possible permutation of events that could move forward, this unlimited deity within Christian religious philosophy has already thought of it and has always known it. That deity is unlimited, has never learned anything. That deity has never improved I mean, it's a really mind-bending concept. But in that particular religion, you've got that deity hanging out with people like me. And I definitely have problems and have learned things and don't know all the things and am not unlimited in power. And so it's kind of a necessary friction if you're going to have a God character who knows absolutely everything 
and his unlimited in power and authority interacting with chumps like me who are just around for a few decades and like read some books one time and tried real hard, but don't know that much stuff. Yeah, but I mean, if, if this infinite being can interact with all these people and it knows all the outcomes, then why did it choose the outcomes that involved pain, Matt? I mean, like, clearly it's evil, right? It's either all-powerful... I don't think that's a cheap question. <laughs> no, it's not. Like, a cheap I, I really it? don't think that. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's one of the most fair questions... That the Odyssey... That, that someone counting the cost of what to make of religious claims of any type, I think it's an... Suffering is an incredibly fair question to ask. And I think there are incredibly thoughtful responses to that and incredibly glib responses to that. But look what's happening here. We start thinking about the afterlife and we cannot help but think about self, family, life, death, eternity, God, determinism, free will. It just gets us into everything. And I'm more than old enough to remember when that was an entirely spiritual conversation. And now literally in the last two, maybe three years, that is starting to become a technological conversation. Uh, that doesn't mean that the afterlife as conceived of for all of human history by all different kinds of expressions of religion is now out the window and the solution to human immortality is some sort of upload. I'm not being deterministic in this or being like, oh, well, I guess now that uh, I guess just science will have to handle this one. No, but but it's fascinating to see this place where it overlaps. I mean, really, what is this? This is your diagram. This is our Venn diagram. Yeah, it's the, I, the realm of the spiritual, the philosophical and the human overlapping with absolutely the ones and zeros of the, the digital sciences. Well, I think. I think the phrase digital afterlife, first of all, I haven't read any of the things you're talking about, so I don't know the context in which you're referring to, but I think digital afterlife could mean how you organize your digital life for after you're dead. It could have that meaning. You know, you could have that really close friend that's going to delete all your search history for you, right? <laughs> so <laughs> you can manage all that stuff. Or you could take it a different way, and I think this is what you're implying, is some type of digital heaven. Yeah, good way to put it. Is that what you're re referring to? Yeah. I remember in 1987, I got a clock radio for Christmas from my parents, mm -hmm. and I was only supposed to listen to the Christian radio station. Oh, Matt. But I didn't. Really? Yeah. What'd there were rock to? stations in Colorado, like KBPI, which rocked the Rockies. Really? And there was also a little pop station out of Fort Collins, and I would tune into that real quietly, like under my sheets at night. <laughs> and I would listen. I'd listen to pop and rock music because it was so much better than the Christian stuff. <laughs> and I mean, you got like DC Talk just yelling the words heaven bound again and again. You can get that from the Christian bookstore in the late 80s, or you can get Belinda Carlisle. And, well, other great stuff. And so I'm listening to everything I can get on the radio, just soaking this stuff in. And there's this one song by Belinda Carlisle that I loved called Heaven is a Place on Earth. I'm like, that sounds vaguely Christian. My parents would probably be happy with that. So I tried it on them. It's like, oh, some bad kids at school told me about this song. And I listened to it. And it sounded like maybe it was sort of Christian because it has heaven in it. Did and you Dad really? And he's like, he's like mm, well, first of all, I have some problems with your story, young man. And secondly... Well, he was actually really nice about it. Secondly, heaven is not a place on earth. Heaven is a place in heaven. It's different. He tried to explain all of this really complicated, abstract philosophy to me, and I did not get it. And then that was the conversation that caused him to be like, hey, maybe we've been a little, a little hard on you about the whole music thing. Like, what if we listen to music together? And then... Like we'll just we'll talk about it. We'll We're going fun. straight and to free bird and simple man. <laughs> absolutely, we did. Absolutely, yeah. we did. Yeah, you did. And then, and then that year, my dad. You know, this is kind of a fun, fun rabbit trail. That year, my dad elected to go and teach at the school where I was going to school. They needed a part-time music appreciation teacher, and that conversation helped to cause him to decide that he would go and do that. And as a result. My dad was the guy who taught me decades of music, including pop and rock and all of that stuff. But I remember that conversation about heaven is a place on earth and dad being like, no, that's not what we believe. And then I remember working out at the gym in like 2015, the first year Black Mirror came out and there's an episode called San Junipero. And as the episode unfolds, you start to realize, oh, these characters are, are their uploads. 
These are dead people or almost dead people and their uploads, their sims, Whoa. living out their afterlife in San Junipero, California, I guess, in the 80s. Maybe they're vampires for a while. I don't know. It was ridiculous. And the point is you can be whoever you want, whatever gender you want. You can have whatever body you want. You can live however you want. You can't even really actually hurt other people in this world. So you can do it. I mean, morality is a totally different thing now. And the whole time I was like, mm, the Black Mirror, like the whole theme of all of this is this is dark. These are not good ideas. But that was the one episode that kind of departed from the dark theme and left it a little ambiguous. Like, would this be desirable or is this a problem? And then as I'm thinking about, oh, it's like Belinda Carlisle's song. Then the song that they played as they drove away on the beach at the end was Heaven is a Place on Earth. And that stuck with me. Fast forward a couple of years. Amazon releases this show called Upload. The guy who did uh, The Office. Uh, I can't remember the dude's name. He put together this show. And uh, it's cute. It's funny. There's only one season, I think. We watched it. And it dealt with some of the logistical problems with an upload society where you're dead can be sent to reside in various levels of heaven and hell, much like the medieval satirist Dante and, and his Dante's takes Inferno. on, uh, yeah, yeah, on your levels of uh, punishment, suffering, or bliss in the afterlife. And it seemed like that made a little dent in the conversation. And maybe I just talked about that episode or those shows with the wrong person, but then it gets into my algorithm and I start seeing stuff about this very famous author who I who I knew about before, Ray Kurzweil. You've heard of him, right? I've heard the name, but I, I don't know where you're going with this. I don't know. I don't know anything about him. Uh, he's a yeah, he, I think he was associated with Google for a long time. He's a futurist. Uh, he wrote a bunch of books. Uh, the Age of Spiritual Machines, I think, is the most famous one. Uh, it coincides with the Matrix late 90s, something like that. I haven't read any of these books. But I start hearing more and more people talk about his ideas for this concept of the transcendent human. And a lot of the transhumanist movements thought seems to correspond with Kurzweil. And then I'm like, well, I, I, is anybody doing this? I just want to look. So I go and I start looking to see where are we actually at in this sci-fi conversation. And dude, people are actually starting to try to offer this service. What? Like you could pay money to upload you yes. to a thing? Yes, <clears throat> but we can't do it yet. So you're buying spots on a ship that has yet to sail. But here's the thing. So this one that I'm looking at, uh, th this is in the uh, uh, MIT Journal, MIT Technology Review from a couple years back. The headline here is a startup is pitching a mind uploading service that is, quote, 100% fatal. And what they go on to describe is a California company. I'm sorry, what? Did you say 100% what? 100% what? 100 fatal. It kills you. Okay. So what they are proposing, no, what they're apparently able to do, I don't know where it's at at this point, is some kind of very complex embalming process for the brain, but the brain has to be totally fresh. And if they do it, it does not upload you to anything. But they think this is the preparation a brain would need to be resuscitated, unbricked, to use the technology language, far later down the road, decades down the road, a century down the road, to take somebody who died right at the front end of this anticipated technology and make it possible for them to be the earliest uploads to some hypothetical digital afterlife down the road. Here's where it gets crazy. It looks like, according to this MIT Journal article, the only kind of person you could do it on right now is somebody who's obviously terminally ill because the embalming process of the brain has to happen while they are alive or in the process of dying. So California has some end of life option act, which this company is supposing would allow enough gray area for them to be able to actually do this on someone. Where are you at on that ethically? Well, um, this is complicated. This is very complicated. One thing that's interesting is um, I recently learned from a, a neighbor who handles artificial insemination of different farm animals. I learned about some of the things that they do in order to collect the semen from the stud animal, and then mm -hmm. they freeze it. And so they can take 
that biological live thing, they can slowly cool it down over this is this very specific cooling profile. And then they can replace the water content in it with glycerol. It's either glycerin or glycerol. I don't know. The water content in the semen? Uh, yeah, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about, dude. I'm just, I'm just going here. This is what, this is okay. what he, we, we were looking at sheep when we had this conversation and, okay. um, you know, I, I was like, man, what's the deal with these? Oh, these are my studs. You know, I, I sell their seed for whatever, for stock. And so if you do this just right and you freeze it just right, these things can stay for a, an extended period of time. What are we talking? A year? Five years? Ten? I, I don't know. I don't know that I'm. I'm doing such a risky Google right now, trying trying to oh, figure, yeah. <laughs> trying to figure this Woo! out. And Better go incognito there, buddy. Why don't you just screen share for accountability? Yeah, I I will gladly do that. And so I'm I'm sitting here. Oh, host disabled. No, please don't screen share. <laughs> so long term storage. I don't know what long term storage is, but long story short, I mean. You can store this stuff for like six years. As I'm, I'm sitting here looking at one academic paper, and it says six years. So we know it's at least that long, but I think it's way, way, way longer than that. What's interesting, when they revive um, the semen after a certain amount of time, it just starts wiggling again and starts doing its thing. And yeah. what's interesting about this is if you think about a seed, like a plant seed, there are documented cases of plant seeds that have been stored in the pyramids, for example. And then yeah, scientists yeah. have been able to plant them, and they're viable. And just a, a plant seed to me is fascinating because it has all the genetic information to further the living being, and it, it has the ability to go dormant for a certain amount of time. And then if it's correctly stored, and then quote, I'm doing air quotes now, if it's woken up or awaken, uh, whatever, if it's revived in a certain way, germination happens, and all of a sudden you have a, a live plant again. Yeah, and obviously everybody knows it does not do anything, though, to bring back the consciousness of the entity that produced the seed in the first place. Yeah, and, that's, and, a good, and that's, that's a good rub, point. Right? Because I love the idea of humanity going forward, but if we're open to it, I'd like to be there. I mean, I like us, but I also like me. So I'd like for my mind to move forward, too, if, if we have an option to do that. I mean, I think that's how people think. Yeah. Proliferation of the species is very different than proliferation of my unique mind. Mm. Yeah. I, I don't know. This is all super interesting to me, but I don't know where we're going with this. I'm sitting here like reading things about freezing your pets um, seed <laughs> yeah. now. Apparently that's a service that the American Dog Breeders Association offers, or they're giving you information on how to do that. There's a whole lot of information, but I don't There's know. like a home kit for how to freeze your pet? No, your your pet seed. Um, I don't think it's a oh, home dear. kit. Yeah, yeah that that got weird in a hurry. But yeah, it's just that's just not where I'm at with my pet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've seen. Have you seen people that will freeze dry their pets? Like it's they basically make a mummy out of their pet. They're like, oh, you know, Chuckles was so great, and then they'll what? have their pet like curl up like it's taking a nap, and then they'll freeze dry it, and they'll just keep it in the corner of the oh. room. Have you seen this stuff? Yeah, I, I saw that. I mean, I assumed it was just taxidermed. Yeah, the, the, it they is. They freeze dried yeah. their pet. That's a thing. Well, that's what tax. That's a. That's like a the ultimate form of taxidermy is freeze freeze drying. It's a very expensive thing to have an animal freeze dried, but it's a it's a thing. People do it. So, is Lennon taxidermed? What? Well, I mean, isn't Len Lennon's body propped up and on display, or wasn't it for a really long time? Oh, we're talking about like. Soviet Union linen? Yeah, that's the one. Uh, I don't know. I have no idea. Like, like Vlad? Yeah, I I hadn't ever really thought about taxiderming a pet or taxiderming a person. Yeah. Obviously, that's for the benefit of the people who would see it and remember the pet or yeah. the person or well, what the person stands which for. Which brings up a good point. Like, what is the point of this so, so-called so digital afterlife? It's Yeah. Is it for the people that persist? After your death, I mean, or is it the thing that you were just talking about? I, you know, you saying I want to be there too. Like, is the point some type of self-centered? Like, I want to persist. I want it to be me. You know yeah. what I mean? Well, that hinges on one very key technological question: If such technology, okay, in a religious context, do you is your understanding of 
Christianity, your religion, that upon death, when you then encounter heaven and God, are you aware that you were a human and that you lived on earth and aware of the context of earth? Or do you become a brand new thing with a fresh new consciousness? Well, I, I think I think your consciousness persists is is the way I would say it. Like you you there is there's a continuation that occurs and in the afterlife you do have the ability to remember things that happened in this life. I think the Christian understanding is that, yes, that the heart will go on. Whereas here the bajillion dollar question is if you get uploaded, is that you? No. It can't be you, can it? No, it's it's the it, and I think it has something to do with where you think you exists. Do you think you exist in the network that is your neurons or do you think you exist in this other thing like the human soul where I, have you ever read the experiments they did back in the day which aren't crazy. They they say, "Okay, this person's on their deathbed. I'm going to put their whole deathbed on a scale." And as they expire, I'm going to see if, oh, yeah. if, if how much the human soul weighs, which, which sounds silly, but it's not silly because I don't, I don't know. I mean, at some point. Really? It does sound silly to me. It doesn't sound silly to me. It sounds like that was a person's like, hey, we got to know. <laughs> we got to know, you know, if there's some so way. So you're not to- saying the results were conclusive. You're saying it's a reasonable question for somebody to wonder about. I think it's a reasonable thing to test. I think it's a reasonable okay. thing to test, and um, I give you that. Yeah, and and so that's that's interesting. So wherever you think you exists, like, do you think it's within these three dimensions? Do you think it's within another plane of existence? Like, we only recently started to understand magnetic fields. We only recently started to understand electricity. You know, we're learning all kinds right. of stuff in crazy physics now. But like, I think there are other forces at work that we just don't know yet. We just don't understand. And I think that's okay. We don't have all the answers. I'm, Henry from Minute Physics would be more uh, capable of talking about this, but like when you start talking about the unified theory of the world and the standard model or whatever they call it these days, I mean, there's certain forces at work. We understand that we have this many things that we know about, and then there's these other things we don't know about, which is why the Higgs boson was such a big deal, and I don't claim to understand any of that. I'm a mechanical engineer. If I can't put a wrench on top of it and turn it, it's hard for me to understand. <laughs> I'm just a simple rocket scientist. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> I do know what you mean. I mock you, but I appreciate your humility and that you do understand the limitations and the narrowness of your field. Uh, That said, you're a real good thinker. I like picking your brain about this stuff. The question... Where do you exist? Where does Matt Whitman exist? It's more than the physical. I'm absolutely sure. Well, absolutely sure. I've known people that have lost appendages, and mm -hmm. it's not like a portion of their soul was gone. They continued to exist, you know, You've known people that have had portions of their brain removed. I know mm-hmm. I know a guy in Atlanta. I met him, was talking to him. He had a brain tumor. He had a significant portion of his brain removed. I went and talked to him after afterwards. I'm convinced it is the same person. <laughs> I am convinced. Yeah. He, he had a little trouble with words, but I'm convinced it is the same person. I can feel the same heart connection with him that I felt to begin with. And, and I don't know how to explain it other than it's that... That knitting of souls that occurs in human conversation, I've had I had the full on feel of that knitting of souls before his surgery and after his surgery, and therefore I conclude that you know that's him, and so that that mm-hmm. kind of leads me to think that he doesn't exist just in the special arrangement of the neural network of the synapses firing inside of his brain. So where where does the person exist? I don't know. I, mean, well, I, I, that, I say that as if it's conclusive. I mean, I can't know that, right? But that's just. That's just where all the evidence is pointing me at the moment. People have wondered this forever. And one of the philosophical exercises that's been around for ages and stood the test of time is the ship of Theseus question. Have we talked about that? I'm I'm familiar with the concept. Yeah. At what point isn't that the ship of Theseus anymore? 
And Go, just you know, brief, you, briefly you re- refresh me on what it is, just so I make sure I understand it. Super simple version. Imagine a ship that keeps on being repaired and fixed and parts replaced. And eventually, after 60 years of being on the high seas, literally every bit of that ship has been replaced at one point or another. Is that still the same ship or is it now something entirely different? Likewise, if a band has 15 different lineups over the course of a 30 or 40 year career cutting albums and members come and go, is it still that band eventually? You know, they own the catalog, they've learned from the previous iterations, they, it all fits together with the previous iterations. Is it still the band? Likewise. If every bit of my body, save like tooth enamel and a couple other things, get swapped out every, I don't know, in middle school, somebody said it was like every seven years. I have no idea on that. But let's say we were such a creature and that is how things work. Am I still me every seven years? And how so? How often do brain cells regenerate, replenish, duplicate? I, I, I don't know. But... Surely between the time you're a little, little kid and you're an adult, overwhelmingly what is you is something physically different than what was you. So the ship of Theseus thing is just an exploration of this question of essence that even goes beyond the self and into what makes anything an identifiable thing over time. Because as you brought up, I think really smartly early on, change is constant. And so any version of a digital afterlife that didn't involve change would be death. I mean, there is no life without change. And if you're not changing, you're in a a test tube. Yeah, not even that. It's over when change stops. So this is meant to account for that truism that people all the way back millennia ago understood and that we understand now. So where do I exist? Well, I think the ship of Theseus exercise has something to say about that. It cannot just be in my physical parts because I am more than that. Do my old physical parts teach my new physical parts stuff? Well, yeah, I mean, I took my biology classes in high school and college. I understand that information gets replicated and passed along. I get it. But is that really a satisfactory and complete explanation for what makes a person a person? I don't think it is. I think essence is a real thing. I think it transcends physicality or chemical things. I think abstraction is real. And I know lots of people think abstraction is not real. It's an other thing. But as soon as a thought has been thought, that thought is real. As soon as a thing has been imagined, that thing is not entirely imagination anymore. It's been giving some substance in the life of the mind. And the abstract and the life of the mind are real. The essence of a person is real. And that, just to take it one quick step further, I see you have a question. That's why I think people should be treated well. And that's why I think slavery is bad and racism is bad and atrocities are bad is because I do think people are more than bags of cells. I think there's something transcendent about them, about us. Yeah, I I agree that we're there's something transcendent, but... The brain is something that's so interesting here because I'm thinking back to the the photographs uh, on photography film. Did you have a photograph you wanted me to look at? Look at this photograph. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> no, the, I, I'm thinking back to specific photographs and like the the memory is a physical thing. So could you say, well, a memory is a physical arrangement inside the brain, and much like the Saturn V. Uh, flight computer. I know this took a really weird turn. No, I'm with you. But when you access the memory on a Saturn V flight computer, you have to read the memory and erase it and then rewrite it. That's the way you access memory on that old school core memory, which is physical ones and zeros. So does your brain, every time you access a memory, are you erasing it and then rewriting it inside the mind? And the reason I'm I'm thinking like that is because you know how your memory can distort over time. That's one thing yes. that's interesting. Another thing that's interesting is I don't know if you've ever have a loved one that's that's had dementia. It's a fascinating. I have. It, it's it's awful, first of all. But the way it's it's heartbreaking. It is, and so uh, you know, there's a very close member of my family that has dementia right now, and. 
it's it's my granny and and when we're talking to granny it's like hey you know today's a good day today's a bad day yeah. and and we'll yeah. talk about uh you know mom will say well you know today we were talking about stuff that happened way back in the 50s and we're just going with that today you know you it's it's just really weird place where there's an there's a memory that's replaying itself in her mind but how is it how is it happening and what's so interesting is Granny can look at me and be like, she'll squint her eyes and she's like, okay, look, I know I'm having trouble remembering right now. So so that awareness of I'm having a difficult time remembering, it's almost like the moral law that was written in my mind back you, – you, I don't know if that makes any sense at all. But the fact that Granny knows her memory is betraying her mm-hmm. tells me that there's some difference between Granny's memory and who she is. Hmm. Did that make hmm. any sense at all? Wow. I, that's a great observation. It takes me back to watching my grandmother walk through the same thing. Yeah, the same same exact language, good days, bad days. My grandpa would go up there to the nursing home in Torrington, Wyoming, and he was beloved there because of his philosophical, ethical persuasion. He'd never put it that way, but he was beloved there because he held an ethical, philosophical persuasion that she was still her absolutely that's still her she doesn't know who most people are she thinks max my grandpa or she did before she died she thought max was a younger version of himself who had a thing for that nurse and she'd get mad and worked up about stuff and uh, spout some pretty angry language that didn't sound anything like her she forget things but max my grandpa was absolutely convinced convicted that's still her. And so he treated her with the dignity and the care and the oath keeping of a husband of 60 years at that point, who believed that even though something physically broke about you, you're still you. And it's crazy, man. My dad came up to visit this week and my dad lives in Colorado. I live up here in South Dakota. And so he goes right through our old family stomping grounds of Eastern Wyoming, where dad grew up. And he ran into some lady with a familiar name at a restaurant and asked where he knew her from. And she quickly connected the dots. She's like, I was a nurse up there in the early 2000s at the nursing home. And you're you're Max Whitman's boy. And I was like, yep, we all adored Max Whitman. And then she went on to explain why. And without using sophisticated philosophy language, what my dad relayed was that she went on to explain they adored him because they worked around people whose brains broke, who physically broke. And whether they ever discussed it or not, their ongoing question is, what makes a person a person? And Max had an answer. It ain't hard. She's still her. Full stop. Discussion over. And it it moved this lady. It affected her. And she remembered it and was 20 years after the fact, ready to recall that and tell my dad how much she thought of his dad for how he responded to the question you just posed. <laughs> This episode of Notum Questions is sponsored by Raycon. You can go to buyraycon.com slash NDQ, and that gets you 15% off your order. Matt, how's your Raycons treating you? Phenomenal. I ran into somebody the other day who was like, hey, you know, you do the stuff on the internet. I like the stuff on the internet. You say you have Raycons. Do you have them? And I was like, boom, yes, I do, because it's part of my everyday carry. I was nice. able to back up the claim. Oh, they tried to call your bluff that wasn't a bluff? It wasn't yeah. a bluff. I've had that happen too. Somebody's like, hey, man. Um, they texted me. They're like, uh, my, my little earbuds that I got on Amazon for like 20 bucks quit working. I'm looking for some other stuff. Do you think I should get the, and they set a brand. I was like, dude, I don't know what to tell you. I legitimately like Raycon. I've been telling you this. For, he's like, oh, yeah, you do say that a lot. But do you mean it? I was like, yes, I mean it. I mean, like. I've run almost 200 miles this year for the Forrest Gump 500, and I've wore my Raycons every time I've wore earbuds. So anyway, it, it's real. I don't know how to say it other than, like, I legitimately like these. They're good. They So the way Raycon works is you put these little earbuds in this little, I don't know, capsule, I guess I would call it. I would Ooh, call I like it. that term, and, yes. And that charges the earbuds. And so... They have a small battery on the earbuds themselves and a large battery in the little capsule. You charge the capsule, and then when you kind of put them back in their holder, they charge themselves when you're not using them. So it's it's a great setup. I really like them. So 
I highly recommend it. You go to buyraycon.com slash NDQ and get 15% off your order. And that's Raycon spelled phonetically as Romeo, Alpha, Yankee, Charlie, Oscar, November. Raycon with an N at the end. By the way, the everyday E25s, they now have a USB-C connector on the charger, which is awesome. That so, is awesome. I know. It's great. So I got Dalen some. So Dalen, the other day, he's like, man, my earbuds died. I was like, Dalen, why are we... I, okay, I'll do this. And so got him some, and then they came in. And before I gave them to him, I opened them up to see what they look like because I'm weird like that. And they had the USB-C connector, and I love it, and I'm going to have to order myself some new ones now because I want that connector. But I have a wait a second here. I want to make sure I'm tracking with you. I am using those E55s all the time, but I also still have my old E25s, but those have the old, what do you call it, micro USB? They don't have the USB-C. Yeah. Are you saying that the new E25s are also USB-C now? Yeah, if you if you go to the website right now, uh, buyraycon.com slash NDQ, that new E25 version has the USB-C adapter. That's exactly what I'm saying. Oh. Oh, well, that's spectacular. That's the last thing I'm still holding on to the old adapter for. Brilliant. Yeah, I'm just going to make that upgrade next time I get those. And the thing about earbuds is, come on, we're all using this for active stuff. That's part of the point is that they're so small and easy to drag around with you and they stay in your ear when you do active stuff. And as I have told you before, I use the Raycons for hitting tennis balls on the tennis ball machine. It's like 200, 300 balls per bucket. And I will hit four, five buckets worth of balls. That's a long time sitting there sweating profusely and banging away on tennis balls. And Raycon does not officially say that they are impervious to my disgusting ear sweat. But anecdotally, I can say they are impervious to my disgusting ear sweat. I have not burned through That's any gross. of these using them as a workout earbud. But I know a ton of people who have used lesser earbuds and they go through them left and right because they can't handle the sweat. Raycons can. Matt, we hold on. Stop. We need to talk about this. Look, dude. I don't think talking about your ear sweat is going to help sell the product that's supporting the podcast. Well, I think it will. I just don't think it's going to work. Look, I think you're a nice person. I really do mean that. I think you're a good dad. I think you're a good friend. And I think you're dead wrong on this point because (laughs) everybody knows that you use earbuds for things that involve you producing disgusting ear sweat. Well, what the people want to know is, will it wreck it if I use this while I do anything active? And what I'm trying to say is, if I can't wreck it doing what I'm doing with sweat, then you can't wreck it. Go to town. But I mean, but like there's so many happy things you could say, like the fact that they have a little button on the side to pause things when you're running. I like that. You could say all these, like the fact that you get like, what is it, over six hours of playtime? No, 24 hours. I don't know. I'd have to read that. But you could say all these happy things, but no, you go straight to the ear hole sweat. Yeah, here's Why? a funny thing, though, because if you, if you have this really cool product that has neat buttons and feels nice when it's in the little capsule and it charges and it stays charged for a long time, but the second you expose it to any kind of rigorous test, like working out with earbuds in and then it gets destroyed, then it I've doesn't matter mine. what kind of features it has. I've actually washed mine in the washing machine and they survived. See, that makes people think about clean things. Oh, I it's like better. what I did there. That was good. Uh, Yeah, let me see if I can help with that, too. Washing things is good. Soap is good. I like fresh smells. And also my revolting ear sweat can't break Raycons. Great. Now, repeat the thing that people go to to get the discount, and then then we're out. And that's how we do the ad. Yeah. Well, you go to buyraycon.com slash NDQ, and you get 15% off. And seriously, I cannot seem to break these things. And they sound great, and they work great, and I love them, and I hope you give them a shot. I don't believe in a digital afterlife. That's where I'm at. Yeah, I, j- I just don't. I, th- I think our brains have the ability to contain memories. I don't know how. I think that we have the ability to access those memories. And I feel like I am something apart from my body. And I feel like there is a level where they connect, and I don't understand that. But that's that's the sense that I have, and that's the best I can do with that. So I don't mm-hmm. think I can take that part of me that doesn't seem to be in the physical world and put it in a physical form that could be uploaded to anything. That's where I'm at. Where are you at? <laughs> I... 
I wouldn't even say I'm conflicted about it. It's just very, very hard for me to think about it because it overlaps into so many other areas of thought and ethics. I'd be really interested, my friend. There was one company that I saw that was talking about, well, we would do a partial upload. So you would be here in this world and there in the digital world. And their ambition is to get to a place technologically years and years from now where they can do this transitional period so that they can answer or try to answer this exact question. At what point does the bulk of you move over into the digital world to the point where you can vouch for you being you in that digital world? And I read that article and I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me to forward it to you. And I thought, how could you trust that vouch? (laughs) Like, how would you know if you weren't you? Hmm. And then, of course, you have to ask the self-reflexive question after that. How would I know if I weren't me? Yeah. Yeah. How would I know if, how would I know if I were an upload? Like, even right now, you know, I I think therefore I am, but am what? Well, that's where philosophy, reason, religion, sociology, looking at other people, comes in to provide some kind of philosophical, ethical framework for thinking about that. And for me, I feel very defined in my faith and by the deity I believe is the first cause, that I think I am made in the image of God, uh, flawed, touched by the brokenness and frailty and entropy of existence, and that the redemptive work of that God is in process, and that at some point we will see the redemption that we read about in a really tangible way. Yeah, I think it's where Jesus fits into the equation. I do think there is an afterlife, and I would like to participate in it. I I would like to be a part of the transcendent. I'd like to be there to see that. I hope along with you that there is growth in that. If there isn't, I don't really understand why there's an afterlife, I guess, but The digital afterlife thing feels, it conjures two emotions for me beyond what I just said. One is dirty. It feels like a cheap, down, dirty, fast way to skip all of the difficult things about existence and hustle right to make me eternal. eh, Gross. It's always the bad guy in the movies that wants to harness technology to become eternal. uh, Power, unlimited power. And that kind of ranting. So there's something about it that feels intuitively dirty to me. But I understand that could be entirely because of my biases, my faith, whatever. The other thing that I feel when this topic comes up is empathy. Dying is scary. People don't want to die. People don't want people they love to die. We get this poisoned well of conversation and disdain that we feel for each other. And on the internet, it's real easy to get super slap happy about who ought to die. Well, I hope you 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 spout things off. But my goodness, is there anything more unifying amongst us as humans than for the most part, if things are even going sort of okay, we think living is pretty cool. And we think it's pretty cool that other people get to be alive too. And we think death is scary and feels unnatural and wrong. It feels abrupt. It feels too soon. And it makes life feel bittersweet. And everybody is grappling with that. It informs so much. And so I see this stuff and I understand how somebody could look at these kind of ideas and be like, that is blasphemy and evil. You're playing with fire, Pandora's box. Maybe like this, this is weird, scary, maybe dangerous stuff. But I also look at the people who are throwing their energy at this and who are excited about something like this. And I'm like, you know what? We have something in common. We understand that death is unnatural, that it doesn't feel right, that it's something that if we had the option to solve it, we would want to solve it. Death is natural. And no, I don't think death is natural. I think death is natural right now, but I don't think that death was part of the natural design for things in the first place. I think that humans are transcendent. I think that people are made in the image of God and there is something lasting about this that is far greater than the human body. And so death is natural based on the ground rules we have right now. But man, there's a reason I think hardwired into our hearts that we kick and scream and fight and that we yearn, that we think we were made for something more than this. Can, Everybody suspects we were made for something more than I this. Can I take a, a swing at that? So, so I think death is natural, but you're advocating that we are supernatural. And so like we as beings 
don't feel like we should be coupled to that natural thing that is death. Is that is that a way to say that? I, I think that's a perfectly fair take. Yeah, I think that that's a good way to put that. I think the natural is supernatural. I don't think there should be a natural world. The fact that there is one, just definitionally, by merit of the word, transcends the natural. If there is a natural world, that came from something that is beyond the natural world. The natural couldn't make the natural itself. So the fact that existence exists is supernatural. It doesn't mean everybody has to believe in my religion or my understanding of God, but this came from somewhere. Another thing I think about when people want to upload their consciousness to a hard drive or a server or whatever it is, it's the desire to continue as we Mm -hmm. are now. And I feel inhibited by this body. Like, I feel like I'm hungry sometimes, and I feel like I'm angry sometimes when I don't want to be angry. I, I feel like mm. I, I have sexual desires I do not want to have at times. I, I, I feel all these things that are a part of this carnal body that I don't want. <laughs> and it would be really cool to shed that. Um, you ever read hmm. Screw Tape Letters? Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm re-listening to it. I'm, I'm just in chapter four right now. And um, he's talking about screw tape letters, as you know, it's it's about how to tempt a person to send them off the rails, so to speak. And it, it's a fascinating book written from the perspective of a demon that's tempting a person, a patient, he calls the person. And one of the most interesting uses of redirecting the the energy and thoughts of the human that he's trying to to send off the rails is by making him hungry or making him fall victim to some of his the needs of his body. I feel that, and, and I think at some point I won't. I don't hmm. know what that looks like, but I don't know. It's it's a lot easier to say, oh, well, you know what death is like. You, you remember what it was like before you were born? It's just like that. <laughs> it's far easier to say that and just accept that, but I... I don't know. I just, I feel like it's more than that. That's the problem. It is a feeling. And feelings are hard to prove. I, I think there's a whole lot of hubris at times when we say, well, we we understand everything about the human mind, and clearly this is a blah, blah, blah. Understanding how something works doesn't mean that we understand how it came to be or all these sorts of things. Anyway, long story short, science has limitations. I feel like I'm more than my body. Yeah. Well, I- All of that's really thoughtfully put. And I I just try to remind myself as someone who tends to be pretty skeptical of things and as someone who likes data and likes to try to make decisions based on data, I try to remind myself that we've always thought that whatever we think right now is the best thinking we ever did since the era of the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. And it always turns out we were wrong and misunderstood things. That's why we keep replacing our science textbooks because we actually have a ton to learn and we're very humble creatures. And so we're doing a great job pooling together the resources of all of our minds, but we don't know all the things. We don't know all the things. I have a theological answer for what I think makes a person a person. I have an experiential answer for what I think makes a person a person. I have a philosophical answer from some of the people I think had the best minds in all of history as to what makes a person a person. I have a legal answer answer for what I think makes a person a person and why we should have laws that protect people and their property from other people and and ill intent they might have. I've got all of these different categories that I feel like I can repeat a good argument here, but I come back to what you just said, buddy. This also, as uncomfortable as it is, it comes down to a matter of essence at some level too, a sense of hunch, of feel. And for that reason, as alluring as the idea might be of jacking the back of my head into a machine and uploading everything into some idyllic Garden of Eden-like environment on some server somewhere, I don't think that will be me. And I don't think that will be other people. I think that will be something that we do to feel better about death that ultimately will be unsatisfying. Uh, I guess I'm open to being wrong, but... That's my read on it right now. 